So thank you so much for um, inviting me to be a part of this. Um, it's been really a wonderful experience to be part of the local um, New Haven Institute and then the Yale National Initiative for the last few years. And I've learned so much from all the teachers that I've been very fortunate and honored to work with. So a lot of the thoughts that I'm about to share really come from these three years of uh, working with different groups of teachers locally and nationally. And I really do feel that my teaching as a university level instructor really became better as a result of really listening to um, the thoughtful ways in which teachers talked about how they approach their students, how they're gauging whether their students are learning or in interested. Um, so it was very, very important to, to have that kind of feedback from um, my teachers. So I think my points connect nicely, I hope, with Brandon's in terms of thinking about what is the role of the humanities, what is the role of the historian, um, in terms of this approach to high-need schools. So I really do have two main points to share, and my first one simply is that I believe our job is to teach students to be, uh, or rather, not, maybe not teach, but just continue to nurture their curiosity. And hopefully we get them when they haven't lost their curiosity. Um, and that, that it's really about somehow finding that spark, finding that connection to the subject for each of them. Um, and then once we have that, is to teach them how to then ask critical questions, how, how to frame those questions, ask them, and then go after the answers. And that's where the skills really are. So I think the ways I've thought about this and the ways I've um, developed the seminars is to do a combination of heavy focus on primary sources and a wide range of sources. So more than just what typical historians might look at in terms of textual or archival documents, whether it's letters or um, census records or things of that sort, those are all really fun to, to delve in. There's a wide range of materials we could be using and introducing into the classroom from the built environment, for example, a walk through the neighborhood, looking at buildings and asking why are some buildings where they are and why um, is the particular geography of your city the way it is, where you suddenly notice there's a quote-unquote black section of town or a Chinese section of town, a white section of town. Why might that be? And start to ask those kinds of questions. Um, or maybe having them look into um, doing oral histories where they're having conversations with people who are older than them, uh, two or three generations older, who may have really interesting stories that they are not at all aware of, or maybe they've heard some, but to engage and delve more deeply. So to have those kinds of connections and to bring in those kinds of materials that hopefully will, will get them to think about the, their place in the world. I, I say this because oftentimes I hear from teachers this problem of students feeling very disengaged because of the textbooks that they might be using. They may be very wonderful in terms of imparting a, a national history or maybe even a regional or state history, but, but coming from where the students may be from a certain um, socioeconomic background or a certain part of the city, they may feel very disengaged from what they're learning. And instead, I think well, that this is where local history and primary sources are incredibly useful for getting students to think about why are things the way they are and to really interrogate that further and not just accept that um, there's always been a poor section of the city, that there's always been um, schools that may be less funded while other schools are more funded, but to think about where were those decisions made um, and how they can learn then to to use those skills of inquiry uh, to then maybe fashion their own position, their own voice, to empower them as historians, as thinkers, who have something to say, who have something um, that they can contribute to the process. So I just wanted to pause for one second and acknowledge, um, an example. so this is a completely dis different example of this, but I couldn't help but want to p f um, bring this in. So I don't know how many of you noticed the exhibit you walked through just now. How many of you noticed? Okay, so not good people. <laughs> you need to be more observant about your surroundings. But that exhibit um, is, is on the history of Japanese American internment based on materials gathered out of um, Sterling Memorial Library, which is where you're sitting in now, and the Beinecke um, Rare Books and Manuscripts Library, which is across the street, the sort of beautiful white marble structure that's now under renovation. 
So the reason I bring that up, because um, that exhibit really grew out of a f um, long history um, of, of the efforts of um, graduate students of mine to look at how Yale, out here in New Haven, somehow was connected to the history of Japanese American internment out on the West Coast. That is, we somehow noticed that Yale had this odd assortment of internment materials, and Yale probably has the largest collection, uh, largest private collection, I should say, of internment materials on the East Coast. Um, and it's almost as large as um, some of the West Coast collections. And so we, so, this, so my graduate students start to really look into this, and this is the outcome of the exhibit. But to go even further back, um, so this work is linked to my, my other field, Asian American history and ethnic studies, which was always about empowering um, people, ordinary folks, to think about their history and ask why there may be silences um, and why certain aspects of history are not um, held in equal value and importance. So I teach here, of course, um, Introduction to Asian American History, and the first thing I always ask my students is, how many of you have had any Asian American history um, in your time from wherever you happen to be? Um, and, and almost always, the only hands that go up are the students from the West Coast and the students who may be from Hawaii. That's about it. So it's not that many students. Or they may say, we did encounter it, but it was the little section about um, the building of the West, where Chinese suddenly appear in the Transcontinental Railroad, um, and maybe Japanese American internment is mentioned. Um, and then we spend time thinking about this. Why are people being written out of history? And what is our um, ethical responsibility as scholars, as historians, to think about reincorporating this history? How does it change our understanding of national histories as well as local histories? And to get students really more involved in that way. So that's my part, part one, is get them engaged, get them curious, and then get them working, um, and get them thinking about how to make a difference in terms of using those skills to, to work. And then the second part I would just say is, because of the, um, I think the population of um, students that high needs schools are working with, and these histories that we're talking about, they can be, there can be very depressing histories, quite honestly. The, um, you know, the histories of, um, of racial exclusion, economic exploitation, um, people who don't get resources when they ask. It, so it's almost constant history of losers that, that can almost come when we do this kind of history. And certainly when I look at my syllabus for Asian American history, it's not until we get to about 1965 that things start to look a little better. Um, and then it's, and it's very hard on the students to come in you know, day in, day out and listen, oh yes, and this is, this is another anti-Chinese um, violence that, that they're, you know, where people are lynched, or here's another example of racial covenants, where uh, restrictive covenants, where people can't purchase houses. So this can be really quite difficult, and I think there's also an ethical responsibility on the part of us as educators of how to um, create the perfect pitch for this um, history as well, that it, we are not here to make students feel demoralized and sad about their own history, but instead, again, to create critical thinkers and people who can engage with that history and then hopefully use it as a way to... Um, move them um, forward in terms of how they engage with the world so that they do care more deeply about social issues, about um, questions of economic or social injustice, for example, and not, um, and not just sort of walk away demoralized. The other flip to that is that oftentimes my frustration as a historian is when I read some of these textbooks, they often have this kind of teleological narrative about them where the world just seems to get better and better as we progress through. So, you know, we had slavery, we had um, exclusion, we ha you know, but then we have World War II, and then Civil Rights Movement, and um, changes in Immigration Act, and it's getting better and better. But of course, you know, the real world we live in is so much more complicated than that. And that, I think, is also what we need to teach our students, is how to think about this complexity, and not to only um, feel engaged if things are better, or only feel engaged if things are worse, but to be able to 
um, have nuance. And I know if anyone's from my seminar, they've heard that word way too many times, um, nuance. So, but I really deeply believe in that in terms of that's how we get students to be critically engaged, not just memorize facts. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.